Hey everyone, um, it's Leo from Ocean Conception Namibia. Welcome. Um, I hope that this is working right now and that you guys can see me. Please uh, just let me know in the comments if you can actually uh, if you can see that we're that we're live. Cool. I can see there's a few uh, six people logged in and a lot in the queue. That's awesome. So. Um, yeah, it's been uh, an exciting few weeks for us. We've been really, really busy with uh, seal rescues. Um, because of the lockdown, we've basically <laughs> not been able to do anything else. Working in tourism has uh, has come, everything has come to a complete standstill in Namibia. So it's given us a chance to to get out there and really do what we want to do. Uh, what, and luckily, we really want to catch seals. So it worked out pretty well for us. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to start hopping into a few questions. Um, I see somebody said that uh, the camera is not great. I apologize. Our internet connection is sketchy at best. So I've had to tone down the quality of the, the camera, um, not to its highest resolution, just because I'm, I don't want the, the feed to lag. Yeah. So guys, uh, give me some questions. Um, yeah. So first question is, uh, there are a few questions I'll get back to that, that were passed earlier, but uh, somebody has asked you, how is Corona for you? Well, luckily I have not had it. Um, Namibia is going through a massive uh, spike at the moment. So we're on hard lockdown again, no, no travel between uh, between states or between between regions, um, a lot of infections, and our town is a sort of one of the epicenters of the of the infection. So it's really um, it's it's forced basically a massive economic shutdown. It's a huge problem for the country, but it's enabled us to to get out there, and we've got nothing better to do right now than to go and catch seals. So it's worked out uh, really well for us. I'm still just trying to figure out this uh, program a bit. Okay, cool. So, um, Julian asked how I'm feeling with the arm. Arm is much better, thanks. I mean, well, I've been overwhelmed with all the the, the support and um, and caring about the arm. Um, it was something that's happened. It's unfortunately, you can see it's uh, it's actually doing a lot better. Stitches came out about a week ago, and I've been back in full swing for a while. It's something that we, it's a risk that we that we're willing to to take. I, I keep saying it's, it's something we're very aware of that can happen at any time. And um, we, we've we learned now with experience how to deal with these things. We immediately um, disinfect the wound as well as we can on the beach, race to the hospital. The problem is with animal bites, um, they can get really infected really quickly. So there's quite a strict protocol we need to follow. Um, got the antibiotics, got another tetanus shot and was back in action pretty soon after it. So thanks for that. Um, okay, so Josh has asked, do we only rescue water creatures? Um, so basically, um, <laughs> well, we've, we've rescued jackals in the beach as well. Growing up, I've, I've been involved with rescuing all kinds of animals. It's just the environment I'm in, being very passionate about nature and seeing the opportunity for the seals has come up and that has led me to, to focus my work a lot more on seals, some dolphins and whales where possible. Uh, we had a turtle last year, but Man, if it if it needs help, I'm gonna help it. <laughs> That's just it's always been my my mantra. Um
Sorry about that. Um, okay, so Ziggs asks, do you ever get attached to the risk animals? If so, how does it affect you? We, we've had a few cases where, like, look, as you've seen, most of the times are wild animals. They just run off like crazy after we're done with them. They, there's not much chance for interaction. We also don't, our intention is very much not to, to habituate animals. We don't want to get them too used to us in any way. Sometimes we've had a few cases where they've turned around and uh, we see them again. Uh, or they, they, they sort of show a bit of, well, what, what we like to feel is affection, but it's probably just more bewilderment after the rescue and they run back to the water. But uh, we spending so much time at the point, we, we see a couple of our, our old rescues over and over again. Um, there's a few, uh, shall bring up a, a picture quickly. Um, this one guy here, and if you, if you remember, he, he was, actually, I'll show you just, uh, this is just before we, just before we rescued him. And this was a few weeks later. Um, he was, uh, we see him, I wanna say almost every day when he's on the coast, uh, he, he obviously goes off to sea to hunt, but he comes back and we see him almost almost every day. Uh, <laughs> so we sort of get a connection. And then there's also, there's certain cases like this, there's one guy at the moment, uh, we call him Julius. He's huge, he's got a massive ball of, of white line around his neck. And we've missed him three times already. He's really cunning. He really doesn't like us. And he's just, it's big. And uh, we will get him. We, we we're on a mission. I'll, I'll, I'll see sort of our, our key focus at the moment is to try and catch Julius. So uh, hopefully we can, we can attend to him soon. Um, so I just uh, clicked on a comment and it disappeared. Was there ever a seal that was so badly hurt that you needed to keep him to heal? Um, it's an interesting question. There they are seals that, that we felt needed post-care. Um, we've had a couple of really deep cuts, seals bleeding, seals that we've thought, but Unfortunately, in Namibia right now, we do not have the facilities to, to try and attend to these animals. Um, there's no rehabilitation center as such. Uh, Namibia is a tiny, a tiny country, um, or a big country with a very small population. We've got 2.2 million people and um, a lot of massive socioeconomic problems. So uh, seals are not a threatened species by any means here. Um, we've got over one and a half million seals. So people don't see the need for something like that. It's something we'd, we'd love to do in the future is to, to incorporate a, um, a rehabilitation program. But yeah, we there, there are seals that we've, we felt needed extra help, but uh, some of those seals we have seen again afterwards healing up really well. Like that one I just showed you, um, he made a tremendous comeback and I mean, he's still nice and fat. He's still hunting and fishing and doing what he needs to do. He's still fully functional. So. The, the salt water on its own is an amazing uh, antiseptic. And um, I'm dealing with, uh, with vets and advisors from all over the world. And, and, and everyone sort of agrees that uh, salt water on its own is, is, does really, really good. We, we're not in a position to, to take it further. I'm, I'm not a vet. I'm not a scientist by any means. But um, on those bad cases, I do have people on call that, that consult me and... Uh, yeah. So basically, to answer your question, there are there are some that are that I would feel could do with extra help, and hopefully, it's something we can actually attend to one day. Um, Paula Carnos, are you from France or born in Namibia? So um, no, I think you're probably referring to Antoine. Um, Antoine is French. Uh, he was. He came to to join us uh, in March for ten days of, of seal catching. Uh, when last year, when he was here on a ship, and um, he he uh, and he got stuck here with the Corona lockdown, and he just he can't get out. So no. So Antoine is from France. I'm Namibian, born and raised. I'm third generation Namibian, um, even further on my dad's side. Um, but yeah, no, we. I'm I'm not French. <laughs> Sorry. I like this one. Do you sometimes give names to seals you rescue? Uh, yeah. So as I said, we've got <laughs> Antoine and I. Antoine and I have a, a funny system of like uh, 
black ties, one with the, the black strap around his neck or necklace or, uh, or um, Julius that I spoke about earlier for, for no real reason. But no, we, the ones we, we do, uh, normally the ones we, we try and catch, like Houdini was another one. We, we missed him a few times till we could catch him. So no, we do, we do sometimes name seals, but normally before we've actually caught them, not so much uh, after we've caught them. We try and keep our interactions with the seals as, as quick as possible. Um, to reduce stress and to, to reduce any uh, any chance of, of them just getting too familiar with us. Okay, so I see there's been a few questions uh, um, about, uh, about our equipment, about our net in particular. So our net is, uh, well, actually, if you guys don't mind, I'm quickly going to. So our net, as, as you can see, has, has seen better days. Um, you can still hear me. Our net, um, this net was kindly uh, donated to me um, by some scientists working in Seattle uh, last year in June, and it's caught nearly 500 seals by now. It, and that, that said, it was second hand already. Um, it's a, it's a very special kind of material, and all the, the bindings and things are really special. I've tried to have more nets made here. I just can't find the right material. So the nets are pretty expensive. With shipping and everything, they're over $1,000. Um, so with our fundraisers, we are having new nets built right now. They are being built in Seattle, and uh, hopefully they will be shipped over here soon. Um, the And the Leatherman you're asking about. So we've got our, our tools that you always see us carry. Uh, Leatherman has been super kind to sponsor us a bunch of these. They are really, really so important to the work we're doing. These things are really hardcore. They're tough as hell. They they really do an awesome job. Um, and I want to say I've got a, like a half a lifetime supply. Uh, I've got like half a lifetime supply thanks to Leatherman. It's it's, it's they've been so kind and I can really. I, we've been through so many different tools for years before this, and for the last year we've been using the Leathermans. And uh, I don't I don't think. Anything can can really replace that. Um, okay, so Imminent Sunrise asked, uh, when you catch seals, do you have to be careful how their flippers are placed when you sit on top of them? For instance, can their flippers break or they they positioned correctly? So these seals are are tough. They're they're really really tough animals. They they're used to being pounded by waves. They can dive really deep. They're running on the beach. They're strong, really, really strong for their size. So um, we, I try and only on the worst cases when they're really active, I try and I'll, I'll put my knees on their flippers. I was advised to do this by, um, by, by some vets who were helping me with seals a few years ago, but you'll see I normally try and avoid actually sitting on them. Um, I rather try and restrain them, rather try and restrain them with my hands. Um, are you planning on increasing your team in the future? Um, so we get, yeah, guys, the, the, <laughs> the response has been overwhelming. There's so many people that ask to volunteer, to come and um, volunteer their time to help out with the project. So at the moment, our, our team is really small. We are only three people, really. It's myself, uh, Antoine, and Katja. Um, we out there on patrol. Uh, I've got Stenzel and a couple of other people that I bring in from time to time to help help me out there. But for the rescue parts, we, we, we're really covered for now unless we start expanding to, to other areas in the country um, and doing uh, and, and maybe bringing in other projects. But I, ideally, I would like to bring in a volunteer program in the future um, if, if things allow for that and everyone will be updated. We'd love to have other people in, especially people that, that can really bring something to the table as well. But for now, our team is small and we, we, we seem to be functioning quite well. So uh, we're going to be keeping it small uh, for now. Um, someone asked, oh, um, have you ever found a mutated seal? We've had seals that are, um, in nature, the, the, the mutations, not, not really often. Um, we found seals mutilated, yes, uh, by by the entanglements with like missing flippers and things. But um, 
other than that, no, seals are pretty consistent, uh, looking like uh, looking like seals. Okay, Jacobs asked, uh, "What got you into risking seals?" So I've always grown up in a in a sort of conservation environment. Um, my parents worked for nature conservation um, growing up, and I have always just been very connected to nature. Um, a few years ago, uh, well. I started this kayaking company at Pelican Point where all the seals are a few years ago and came across the seal that needed help. Uh, he was dragging a net in the water. This was about eight years ago. And we just uh, just grabbed him and uh, cut him loose. And, and this was awesome. I just, uh, I really, really felt great. So we just, one thing led to another. We started catching more and more. And uh, it just, it was it was a great, uh, it was a great experience. And it just, it just sort of compounded from there. Yeah, Jamie's asked, how can you tell the difference between the male and the female seal? Um, with time, you start, start to learn the, 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 the very subtle differences. Um, it's uh, The females are normally a little more slender in the face, a little bit more feminine, I like to think, uh, whereas the, the males are normally a bit, a bit bigger. Um, and, of course, there's the, the genitalia as well. It's, it's not you really have to get a little bit invasive to look, but... Um, you can normally quite see where the, where the pups have been suckling or um, you can see the male organs as well, uh, especially on the bigger males. So that's normally, and with the very big animals, it's normally pretty clear. If they're over a certain size, when they're really big, they're, they're male. The females only get to about 100 kilograms. The females can reach up to 350 kilograms. It's, it's really big. Um, do the seals recognize the car and you? Um, it, it's a tough one. They, no, I feel like still every time we go into the group, they still run for their lives. Like they've never seen us in their lives before. Even by now, they, they must have all seen us many, many times, which I need to always reinstate. It's a good thing. We like our seals wild. We need them to be wild animals. We don't want them to be habituated um, to us. Um, this will only get them to trouble. Not everybody is going in there with the same intentions. And we don't, we Contrary to how it might look, we, we try and disturb them as little as possible. We only go in when we're quite sure we can actually make a rescue. It's something we just plow through the groups, chasing seals around. Um, so, no, um, there's definitely some environmental factors that change. If the visibility is bad, if it's very windy, they're naturally going to be a bit more on edge and they will be more scared of us. So, we, if it's too foggy or if it's too windy, we don't go out because we do cause too much unnecessary uh, stress to the groups then. Um, have you ever found a dead seal? If so, uh, how did they die? So yeah, we with I mean, look, the colony we that we're working at has anything up to eighty thousand seals. Just by by default, by nature, there are going to be a lot of dead seals um, around. You'll see them in the videos sometimes too. We get a lot of questions about well, while we're running, uh, jumping over seals that uh, people are saying are dead. A lot of those are just resting in their sleep. It's very hard to tell if they're dead or alive, except if they normally just if they've got a lot of sand blown over them. There's no one coming out to clean the beaches. There are a lot of jackals and seals and other uh, scavengers on the beaches that, that are the sort of cleanup crew that uh, that pick up the, the dead animals. But no, um, we, we do see dead animals. And from time to time, we do see dead seals. I want to say about twice a month, uh, maybe a bit less, we'll find dead seals with entanglements that have died because of entanglements. We can only assume that these are usually animals that have died out at sea um, that... That, that we haven't found uh, and it, it's always really sad to see but uh, we just unfortunately we, we can't get to every single one um, he's asked are there any any tourists on the beaches where you where you say the seals so yeah this is actually um, the beach where we are on um, is a national park, but um, beach access is allowed. It's always a problem, um, especially during breeding season. People come too close. The small pups um, cannot, uh, for the first little while after they're born, they can't actually swim. And when you get all these big males, especially when the big bulls are there, if people get too close, they all go charging into the water. And um, it can be that these little, one gets, little ones get trampled. It's also a big reason why normally... From November till the end of January, we're actually doing very few rescues. 
even though the seals are there, they are entangled, we can't risk um, these stampedes in the group. So unfortunately, the pupping time also coincides with the main tourist season. So we do have our hands full chasing people away, trying to keep them away, educating people not to get too close to the seals because most of the time they don't know it, but they could actually be causing a lot of harm. Um, so up to the entanglements, what's the weirdest thing we've pulled off the seal? Um, a surprising amount of, of clothing. We, uh, so I've actually brought a few things here the other day. So I want to, so the bat, one of the weirdest things uh, we've definitely ever found, um, I was with uh, Jelly from the Namibian Dolphin Project a couple of years ago, and we found a seal with a, he actually had a full toilet seat around his neck. I mean, like a, like a small toilet you would find on a, on a boat, uh, maybe a yacht or something, but this thing was really jammed up around his neck. Um, we get a surprising amount of, of clothing. This is actually a, a, a T-shirt from the from a Cameroon soccer team um, that must have fallen uh, must have fallen off a ship or something. And the seals love to just get. Uh, they're so playful. They just pick up. They play with everything they can find. So we we find yeah a lot of clothing, shirts, jackets, caps. Um, I've got this is a piece of a cap uh, like a normal peak hard hat. I want to say probably 10 this year already. We, we get a lot of hats. So, and then just, so the most common entanglements are definitely fishing waste, but you find, I mean, we, we find a dog leash, a perfect like dog leash, the, the handle part around the seal's neck. So no, we do find some, some pretty weird things. Um, do we report the legal gill nets? Uh, are those entanglements coming from this boat just offshore? So it's it's a difficult one to trace. Um, the most common entanglement by far, if you've seen the videos, are these uh, these fishing lines. These are commercial hand lines. So you've got guys going out, they're catching a commercial species here called snook. It's a lot like a barracuda. And they've got these uh, these big lead weights and these big hooks on them. You've seen we've pulled quite a few of these hooks of seals before. So these lines are either lost while fishing or maybe dropped overboard, maybe thrown overboard um, intentionally, but it's, it's very difficult to, to trace it back to anybody. Um, so who do, who do we report it to? We, we're trying to, to raise awareness. Of this. this is a big reason why we're doing this work. We're trying to create a, a global awareness for this problem. So. Um, a lot of the fishing factories have shut down over this time now, and we've just had very limited access. The, um, we we have some some uh, some education plans in place. It will be implemented once we've got more freedom of movement, um, consulting the fishing companies, and just getting more down to the to the the cause of the problem. Um, you see, what we're doing is we, we're treating the the symptom of the problem here, and we need to get to the root of this. We need to tackle it from the from the source. And regarding the boats offshore, there's always a lot of boats offshore that you see in the background in the videos. Most of those are not fishing boats. A lot of those belong are oil industry boats. They are um, crew carriers, con uh, drill ships, container ships, bunkering boats. Um, due to the economic recession all over the world, a lot of these boats get stored in Namibia because it's a cheap and safe port. And I think a lot of these boats have people on board, uh, on board the boats, they are bored and they're fishing over the side. So a lot of the lines we can see are really basic, not commercial, not proper fishing lines. And these guys are, are fishing off the boats. So it's very difficult to control that. Um, again, it's not illegal what they're doing. So how do you how do you tackle that? So I'm just trying to find a comment again, but they're coming in pretty quick. So, um, okay, somebody just asked um, if uh, if uh, or to, to tell me about the work with the to tell you guys about the work with the dolphin project. So the Namibian dolphin project's been around for for the last like 12 years. Um, Simon and Tess, who run the project, are old friends of ours, um, and they're doing amazing work in Namibia. The Dolphin Project is more um, research-based, and they've been 
doing amazing work studying especially uh, dolphins and whales and things uh, in Namibia for many years and crossing over now into uh, into seals as well. Um, so we we work really well together. They are the scientists. They're writing the papers and things, and we like to to help out. We like to catch seals, and and like I said, we we're trying to facilitate uh, the researchers wherever that we can. We have the opportunity to be there all the time. So all the information you'll see us always filling out our logbooks afterwards and our data sheets and the videos. Everything is going to them, and everything is being collated. They are writing various papers, and with that, um, hopefully we can. Um, bring this all to government. If there's uh, policies that need to change, then these need to be backed up with scientific data. And uh, this is a very cool uh, collaboration we're doing with the, the Dolphin Project. Um, have you caught a seal that you saved before but got tangled again? Um, we have, actually, we've, uh, we've had we've had quite a few seals with, um, say, a fishing line on. Um, it's low down in his body, and you can see an old scar from a previous entanglement. Most of the seals that have been entangled um, do have old scars. You can always see if they've, been, if they've been caught before. And we've even had a few seals with two different entanglements. We've had a seal just the other day with a, he had a packing strap and a ball of fishing line around his neck. So he's really uh, um, he's, he was very unlucky or just very, very playful and just couldn't help himself and just played with whatever he could. Um, oh, good question. So this is one of the, um, it's not one of the major colonies. Uh, so we, we, we work on Pelican Point, um, which is about 35 kilometers drive from, from the town we live on, on the peninsula at Pelican Point. Um, our group of seals has, our colony has about, um, well, anything between about 30, maxing out about 80,000 uh, seals during breeding season, depending on the time of the year, a lot of the seals come in and out, but we we're working on about yeah between 30 and 80,000 seals on average i'd say for most year there's probably around 40 to 50,000 seals on the beach now cape cross up north of here um has anything up to 400,000 seals so the 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 work we're doing um might seem great here but it's it's unfortunately still just a drop in the bucket we we have so many more colonies in namibia um I do believe our seals that that we are working on have more exposure because they're in they're basically living right next to a big fishing port. They have more exposure to entanglements, but that's not to say there aren't a lot more entanglements uh, in the other colonies as well. Okay, uh, whenever the seals are deep cut, why does the seawater help to heal the wound quickly? Um, seawater is naturally quite antibacterial and antiseptic. Um, all the, a lot of the infection can't live in the seawater unless it's being fed the whole time. So when they get a, when they get a, a deep cut, um, the, the line will keep aggravating the wound, keeping the infection going all the time. Uh, as soon as that line is out, the skin can actually, the, the flesh and the skin can start healing again. And the salt water is really good at cleaning out the wound and then helping the, helping the healing. Um, have we ever saved the seal from a near-death situation? Um, I was like to think that pretty much all the seals we are in, uh, all the seals we deal with are in a, in a near-death situation. They're, they're really, uh, most of the cases that we attend to, um, I think it's safe to say that if we do not catch those seals, it will it would it would cause their death, especially with things like fishing line and packaging straps. They get uh, these seals grow at such a fast rate, especially the youngsters, that there's no way for these things to naturally come loose on their own. Something those those fishing lines have probably 120 kilogram breaking strain, so they're not going to just pop off on their own, and they need to uh, they need to be able to uh, um, to to live. So. Yes, I think uh, most of the seals. So we, we've had some seals that were really, really bad. Um, that I would say the, the the death situation was was closer, 
but no, we want to say that all the seals are in near-death situations, actually. Um, what is Antoine's size criteria to call the seal a puppy? Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> it's funny. He, I think anything smaller than himself is a, <laughs> he calls puppy. It's okay, puppy. But uh, no, uh, <laughs> he likes to, he loves to talk to seals. It's so amusing going out through the videos afterwards, listening to him uh, talking about the, <laughs> talking about the, and talking to the seals. Uh, he's actually sitting just behind the computer. He's, he's very shy, but uh, he, he's laughing. Um, so, Mr. Neil Dreyer, <laughs> so that's my dad actually, asked what's the worst entanglements. Um, it's funny, the worst entanglements are actually the, the really, really tiny, thinnest pieces of, they like like dental floss, but um, they're very hard plastic and they cut really quickly. So, when the seals have a lot of line on, it takes quite a while for it to, to, to really cut in. But these really thin lines are the worst. They go, they go so quickly. I want to say within a week, these things start cutting into their skin. And uh, they're also really difficult to see. That's the problem. Those thin lines you only see once there's actually a wound. Um, you see the wound, not the line. So I want to say those are the worst guys to deal with. Um, a lot of people ask this question, how do we manage to spot the seals with uh, plastic around them so easily? So we... We spend like five hours a day out there with binoculars. Um, by the end of the day, um, <laughs> our shoulders are so tired from holding up binoculars. We just we go from group to group, move like 100 meters at a time, and sit and scan. Sometimes I sit in the roof to get a bit of views. Antoine stands in the tire, and we're just scanning from side to side all day long with binoculars. So we've got strong binoculars. You would never – sometimes when you see them without binoculars, you know uh, you're lucky. Sometimes we get to see them without binoculars, but otherwise we're always just spending a lot of time behind our binoculars. So sometimes I do see uh, questions and then as soon as I try and click on them, they've disappeared again. Um, okay. Have you ever found a six heel like uh, Seal with sickness. So yes, um, there are some natural sicknesses that do occur in the seal colonies. Um, sometimes we'll get animals just lying on the beach that are really, really thin. Really, uh, that you can you can see they're not well. Um, we with a, a vet from California last year, um, Dr. Frankfurter. We 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 caught one, took it to the vet. Um, and there was just nothing that could be done for this poor animal. This guy had actually had a, a, a bad, a very, very, very bad infection in his jaw that was just it was too late for him. But no, uh, sicknesses is sicknesses are um, natural in a lot of animals, so they it's something that does happen. And um, again, fortunately, I'm not a vet. I wish I was, so I can't always uh, do more about this. Um, what do we do with the dead seals? We do absolutely nothing with them. It's a natural process. Uh, the seals that have died naturally get left on the beach. Um, there are a lot of jackals. Up at Pelican Point, you often see in the videos, jackals in the background. There's about 18 jackals living out there at the moment. There's a lot of seagulls and other birds uh, preying on the dead animals. So it's all part of the, the food cycle. Um, we're not uh, going to we're not gonna disturb that. Would a drone help you better to spot entanglements? Absolutely. Um, we we uh, we have put in applications to, to be able to use a drone. The problem is it's a national park. And in Namibia, all national parks are sort of um, under the same rule blanket. And as you know, in Namibia, or maybe you don't know, in Namibia, we have massive problems with poaching of uh, rhinos in particular and a lot of game animals. And drones are a preferred method for poachers to find rhinos and animals like this. So as a rule, drones are not allowed to be flown in national parks, even though there's definitely no rhinos in the Dorop National Park, which is purely coastal. Um, they all fall under the same rules. So very special permits need to be applied for. We have applied for these permits. Hopefully they'll come through because, yes, drones would, would be a game changer for us um, to spot entanglements because 
we're, we've got a very one-dimensional view of the of the group of seals. We can't always see the seals that are over the ridge or in the middle of the group. Sometimes they're all lying down. It's impossible to see them all. And if we could fly a drone over them, especially low-flying drones, um, low-flying drones do cause disturbance in animals. So we'd ideally need a bigger drone with a zoom. But uh, yes, to answer the question, simply uh, a drone would be would be really well. Okay, another interesting question. How long do the seals beach again after every catch? So we, we've monitored this a lot. Um, we, again, we, we hate the fact that we do cause some disturbance in the groups, but um, from experience, when they all go charging into the water like that, um, they will, remember we, we normally there early in the morning. If we get there by lunchtime, all those seals are in the water anyway. They, their natural cycle is to hang out and go into the water throughout the day in and out. So it's not that they're um, hibernating or something like that. But when they do all charge into the water, normally within about 10, 20 minutes, the first ones will start coming back. And within half an hour to an hour, all the seals are back on the beach where they were um, as if nothing ever happened. Ooh, um, are you guys vegan? So, Antoine is uh, is very strict vegan. Um, since about November last year, um, I went through through quite a change. Um, I'd like to say right now, I'm I'm, I'm not going to call myself a strict vegan by any means, but um, I live about 95% plant based now. Um, it was quite an adaptation. I did consume a lot of meat before, and have have cut it out to barely uh, to to real minimum. Um, it's uh, it's very difficult being vegan in a country like Namibia. It's very uh, meat-centered culture, and it was a big ad big adaptation, but it's something that uh, I do feel uh, quite strongly about. So, yeah, um, no, I'm not fully vegan, but I, I'm, I want to say close. I know that doesn't really count, but yeah. Have you ever risked a turtle? Um, we last year um, there was a turtle uh, in the fishing harbor. Some fishermen called me, and I used my seal net. We managed to catch him and took him to the uh, to the vet uh, to the aquarium in Swakopmund. There's nobody in Namibia really that qualified to work on turtles, but they consulted with people at the Two Oceans Aquarium in, in Cape Town. Mm -hmm. um, the turtle had some really bad infections. He also had a problem where he couldn't dive anymore. He just simply like they, they even tried putting weights on him. It's like his uh, his, his buoyancy was just stuck on. On full, he could not dive at all, and his, his condition just deteriorated. Unfortunately, there to to euthanize him later. We do have transient turtles passing by, but no turtles breeding in Namibia. Actually, and only right in the northern tip of the of the country, where the where the water is a lot warmer. But um, no, I wish I could deal more with turtles. I love turtles, um, but it's not something we get to see very often at all. Um, how old are you? Um, I'm 37. Uh, a lot of people think, a lot of people are surprised that the, I've not been kind to my skin over the years. I spend way too much time in the sun, not using enough sunblock. It's all changed now. I'm actually spending way too much time with dermatologists now. But uh, no, the years have, uh, have not been kind. But uh, no, I'm, I'm 37. Um, what temperatures does the coastal water have? Well, around here at the moment, um, in winter, it's down to 11, 12 degrees. Um, so when you see Antoine and I running right into the water, it's it's not something we do happily, but it's something we can be willing to do. In summer, the water will go up to 20 degrees or so, but uh, for most of the year, it's under uh, under 14 degrees Celsius. I'm not sure what that is in Fahrenheit, but it, it's cold. It, it, it's it's really cold. We've got the cold Benguela current system, which comes up from the South Atlantic, from Antarctica, um, which veers off further up, up the coast. But uh, no, we still get really, really cold water here.
Uh, what's the most annoying thing about this job? As we all know, the best thing is saving someone's life. Annoying is um, probably when we when we miss seals. Some days we we just miss a few seals. Um, they they're too close to the water. They're too fast for us. Sometimes they get called bodyguards. Get these really big ones around them, getting really aggressive when we get close. So it's always annoying. But at the end of the day, most of those seals we sort of make a mental note and we get back and we make a mission to try and get those ones that we've missed, especially the ones that seem like they they're they're in bad shape. Um, the entanglements they get they get in the open sea or near the shore. That's a very good question. Um, so often we're picking up big balls of fishing line on the beach. Now, those balls of line in the water sink. So those, I think most of the entanglements are picked up in the ocean, um, definitely. But sometimes those balls of line are then brought to the beach, maybe shucked off by the seals and end up lying on the beach again. And then other seals maybe pick them up on the beach. Um, we've seen seals playing with a ball of line on the beach that could very easily end up in an entanglement. So it's very difficult uh, to say. I do believe most entanglements do occur in the ocean, um, but if they find the right. They, they, they're very playful on the beach too, especially in the in the first few months. They don't spend that much time in the water, and you see them playing with anything they find on the beach. Um, do you have any pets? Man, my house is like a, a farm. We have um, four dogs that uh, very begrudgingly have been uh, put outside at the moment because they get really noisy. Um, we have uh, five cats. And normally at any given stage, there's some sort of animal. We've had seals in the yard. We've had pelicans at some point for, for quite a few months in the year. Um, we... The kids bring back anything that's <laughs> in that as well, little birds and things. So, no, we, uh, I do have a lot of pets. I've always loved pets, and they, they do play a big part, of, big role in our household. Um, will you ever give up on a seal if you don't catch it? From Molly. Uh, Molly is my daughter, actually. She's uh, seven, and she was uh, out with us yesterday, actually, catching seals. Um, no, we'll never give up. We if we see a seal, uh, we will keep going on. We'll keep going for it until we get it. This is something we can't just get over ourselves. We're never going to just say no. Sorry, we can't help this one. Few, the only times we have given up on a seal is just when it's physically too big for us to catch. Um, and even with that, we are we are looking at um, ways to to try and. Um, uh, how to sedate the animals, the really big ones. But that's a whole different kettle of fish that involves team vets and technicians and things on the beach with us. But uh, we, we are working on a project to, to do that as well. Um, good question. Are all the seals less likely to have entanglements? The trend is definitely that, yes, we do see... Um, less entanglements in the older seals. If we look at our at our logbook throughout the year, um, the seal entanglements start getting really bad from May usually every year, and this is quite coincidental with the time, or quite uh, consistent with the time that the seal pups start leaving home. But the seal pups will stay on the beach essentially for a year, nursing with their moms. They will stay with their moms, drinking. Still, they're not that reliant on hunting their own fish, but Every day they need to spend a lot of time in the water and they go out, they go deeper into the bay and they start catching their own, and they start just exploring. They, they need to spend time in the water. They need to learn to be good seals. They need to dive and swim and uh, learn to sleep in the water. So they get more exploratory and these guys start going, venturing further and further offshore and that's where they're picking up the entanglement. So it's safe to say that this is the time at about five, six months old that they start heading out and that's when we get the most entanglements. The bigger ones, yes, we do get seals of all sizes entangled, but definitely a lot more common. I want to say probably around 60%, 60 if not more, of our entanglements are with pups less than one year old. Um, how did I meet Antoine? Um, last year um, in about July, 
August. Um, the so Antoine works for Sea Shepherd. Uh, he was um, chief mate on a on a ship on Sea Shepherd that came into Namibia to do some patrolling with the Namibian authorities. Uh, they were in the port, and um, Antoine and I met uh, at our local gym. Um, we started chatting, and him and uh, Alba, another uh, another crew member from the boat, came out with me. Uh, because it's a bit of a scary situation. You need to know what you're doing out there. And Antoine was really committed. He jumped straight into it. Um, he wasn't reckless. And um, so we went out again. And that's when we started chatting about our 100 Seals for Time campaign. This is a campaign we did in... Uh, so the idea was that we'd get some more crew from the Sea Shepherd. They would come in June this year and we'd try and catch 100 Seals in one month. And everything was on track for that. Um but because of COVID, that couldn't that couldn't happen. Antoine had some off time in March, and he came to visit uh, for ten days, which has turned into well like six months now, um, because he can't he physically couldn't leave the country because of the lockdowns. Um, Has Antoine ever got bitten by a seal? Antoine's got a, uh, he's had a few scrapes. You'll see Antoine's a lot faster than me. <laughs> and uh, he, he, got a, he got a scrape on his knee a while ago and another on his leg. And he's had a couple of really close calls as well. He's been uh, lucky enough to, to avoid any, any major bites so far. We're hoping it, it stays that way. Um, why did we start? Why did I start this job? Um, again, it's not okay. I guess it is a, a job now because it's it's what I'm doing pretty much full time. But um, but uh, no, I, I just they we saw this problem and no one else doing anything about it, and we just didn't uh, couldn't stand. The thought of these animals uh, being in trouble like this, so I just felt uh, uh, an obligation to to do this. So yeah, I guess that's why why I started it. And yeah, there was another question um, about how long I'll keep doing this. I just I lost the comment, but I'll keep doing this uh, for as long as I can, as long as I'm able. Um, did you ever think your videos become popular? So that's a an interesting question. The, um, no, I initially only started taking videos because I wanted to show my kids and my family what I was up to. Um, and I started putting them on um, Instagram just because I hadn't posted anything for a while. And uh, they just it, it, it blew up on Instagram. It was, it was quite, a, quite a revelation to see how, how into this people were. And this led me to sort of believing like, wow, this was actually sitting in a big problem here. And this is uh, by these videos being so popular, it's giving me a platform to actually uh, showcase the problem. So this is where it's come from. Um, it's not that it's fun running around with the camera, but uh, it's, it's, it's an awesome, it's given me the awesome opportunity to, to show our, our organization, show the work we're doing and, uh, and just bring to, to light the, the seriousness of the situation that we're dealing with here. I um, heard someone speak German in one of the older video. Um, we had one video, so I I can I speak I speak German enough enough to get by. Uh, Katja, my wife is German. Our kids speak German. Uh, she speaks German with them at home, so I can speak enough German to get by. Um, we had some fun, and I were dealing with a really big seal on the beach just by chance. There was. Uh, a Swiss and an Austrian guy driving by, and I just said, "Hey, listen, guys, we need some help," and they came in uh, to help us. It was a really big seal, um, but uh, yeah, you you hear all kinds of uh, languages popping up on the videos.
do you think many more schools need help? Um, definitely. As I said, we've only got access to a very small part of the of the of the sort of seal population as a whole in Namibia. We there are a lot more colonies, a lot bigger than the one that we're dealing with. Um, so again, uh, bureaucracy is always a problem in a in a country like Namibia. Things take time, but we we're working again, working very closely with the Namibian Dolphin Project. We're trying to to bring in more scientists uh, to, to have more papers written, and with this we need special permissions. But this will help us uh, to hopefully get access to all the other regions in the country as well, where we can um, expand on the work we're doing. Um, I can mute the t-shirt. So we actually do have some very cool, uh, we've had so many requests for merchandise. Um, we've got, um, we do have a, a YouTube um, um, merchandise section. Pretty much we've been working on this all weekend. So pretty much after after today, uh, I'm not sure actually how it's all been sort of submitted. Uh, in the next few days, there will be a, 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 a Teespring um, merchandising option on our YouTube channel. Unfortunately, <laughs> these things don't ship to Africa, so the irony is that we can't actually see the, the storefront where we are in Namibia, but it is there. We we would have loved to have produced uh, our own shirts here and send them all over the world, but you're going to be looking at like four-month wait time for a T-shirt uh, anywhere else in the world with exorbitant uh, shipping fees. Um, are seals fluffy? Um, yeah, they. It, it's funny. Their textures change quite a bit as they grow. There are some really, um, the really small ones when they're still like pitch black, are really fuzzy, really soft, uh, like a cat. The bigger ones um, are like a, I want to say like a Staffordshire or like a, a short-haired dog, and the really big ones, their fur gets uh, gets quite coarse, especially the big males, um, a little bit tough. And then when they when they're wet, they just well, like a like a wet dog, I guess. Um, how do seals smell? Uh, I was going to say <laughs> with their noses, but <laughs> they uh, no. I think what you meant, like how they how they physically smell. Um, Yo, um, the bigger ones, especially when they start getting ready for mating season, get like a really strong uh, musky smell. Um, they can get quite smelly. The smaller ones, I want to say, are, are really neutral. Remember, they're going into the water all the time. They, they're they washing themselves all the time in, in the ocean. So generally, they don't really smell. Sometimes they've got really bad breath, and sometimes the beach stinks a bit because there's a lot of poo and wee and things on the beach as well, especially on, uh, on low tide. The high tide flushes that all the way, but... Uh, no, generally they they smell fine, but they can they can get a little bit of beer from time to time. Um, how many seals do you think you have saved at all? Um, we've been trying to 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 quantify that just the other day. Actually, um, our tally for this year alone, now um, as of yesterday, is four hundred and thirteen seals, which is which is a crazy amount. We were hoping to get like two hundred seals for the year, so. That's been it's been quite phenomenal. Considering that uh, by the time Antoine came in March, I was only on I think eleven seals for the year so far. So it's been a phenomenal year so far. In total, it's very difficult. I've only really started counting for the last uh, two or three years, but I would say in total probably around a thousand two hundred animals by now. Who's getting fast? <laughs> Fit or faster? You are the seals. <laughs> yeah. So we we are. We we're definitely uh, giving the seals a bit of a workout every day too, but so are we. Those those beach sprints, especially when uh, when you're the unlucky one carrying the net, get really intense. Um, sand people don't underestimate how soft the sand is, and how hard it is running in, in soft sand. That's why most of the time we're running barefoot. Uh, we find we're a lot quicker barefoot, which I know isn't probably the safest thing, but uh, when speed counts, we 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 we, we shuck the shoes to, to to be able to get there a bit faster. Oh, it's clicked on the wrong comment. Um, 
what technology would help the most uh, zippers that don't jam? Yes, that would definitely be a, a, a cool one. We, we've, we've thought about using Velcro, but some of the seals are just so big, they'll just pop the Velcro open and we don't have the luxury of time to, to sort of tie it up physically each time. Zippers are the most effective, but sometimes uh, those nets get dragged through the sand and they do jam up a bit. We've tried to find the most heavy duty zippers we can. And uh, the new net being built is actually going to have three different zippers on it to give us access to more parts of the seal, firstly, but also that we've got more backup points if one zipper jams, we can have uh, different access points um, in case of, uh, of an equipment malfunction. Have you ever tripped and fallen while catching a seal? Um, <laughs> we, I've, had, I've been pulled over by, by a seal while running a seal, grabbed the net and sort of threw me off balance. Antoine has uh, had one or two little slip and slide uh, situations before too. Um, at some point we'll make like a, a behind the scenes, like a, a fail reel. <laughs> there are a lot of things that don't make it to video, but um, no, we do not each video, not, not each rescue goes, goes perfect, but we also, we we're quick enough to, to get up on our feet and still carry on the rescue uh, if we fall. Um, is social media anything you're doing or is there another job for living there? Um, social media is, is is not our job at all. I'm not a, a, um, a YouTuber. Maybe the awkwardness and the, the lack of professionality of this will, will highlight that. Um, no, I'm, 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 I'm definitely don't consider myself a YouTuber by any means. Uh, the um, social media... Social media is just uh, giving us a voice for our, for our organization, Ocean Conservation Namibia. We are trying to get a message across the world, and social, the world we're living in right now, social media is the way to go. It's, it's a brilliant. Luckily, people like the rescues and the videos of the rescues, so social media is, is helping us really, really well, but, and also providing us with a, um, an income stream through, uh, through ad revenues and through... Uh, um, showing people um, and giving access to our funding, our different um, funding campaigns. But uh, no, my actual job is Ocean Conservation Namibia, um, actually going out rescuing seals. Uh, it's not uh, the, the social media is, is a byproduct of that. Um, and I had a few comments earlier asking about the, the editing. Um, no, so right now all the editing I'm doing uh, myself, it is... Uh, Again, back to not <laughs> the video. You can see these aren't like high quality uh, broadcast edits. Uh, these are chucked together by me after after a day of sealing. I get I get down and um, try and do a bit of editing. I'm still learning along the way. Three months ago or six months ago, I had never edited a video in my life. So there's still a lot to learn. It's been a massive learning curve for me. But again, thanks to COVID-19, I've had a little bit more time on my hands to to figure these things out. Um, are there ways to uh, to capture seal without causing a stampede? Um, it's very difficult. We we try and there in certain situations, like in in the breeding season when all the seals are on the beach and it's really we can't get too close to them with, with uh, because of fear of causing a stampede. We will uh, I've got a long hook, long pole, like a two and a half meter long pole with a very sharp hook on the end. The inside of the hook is sharpened. And I'll sort of slowly, slowly, slowly crawl in. It's a very time-consuming process and can only be done when there aren't other pups close by. Um, it can only also be done on seals that are really out on the outside of the group that are accessible. Um, so when I can use this, this, this type of system, I do, but it's not often that I'm actually given the opportunity to, to, do, uh, to do this kind of rescue. Um, how heavy is the seal net? The seal net's pretty heavy. Um, I don't know, I'd say probably around um, probably around 10 to 15 kilograms. And then once it's once it's wet, it get it like doubles in weight. It gets really heavy. And so it's a very big surface area. So when it's windy, which we have quite often out there, when the wind comes up, um, we we need to uh, it gets very difficult to run with it because it gets we get blown all over the place.
Okay, guys. Um, I see our, our, our time is sort of running up. I'm going to I'm going to take one more question. Um, are seals are the seals risky? Technically, see lions. So this is a question I also get very very often. Um, we technically they are not sea lions, even though um, we call them seals, but we should be calling them fur seals. Fur seals are a group of seals that are a bit more a group of their own. Um, sea lions are their own group. Seals, like the traditional sense, like the harbor seals and things you get up in Europe, and uh, the um, well, yeah, the the Weddell seals. The most of the seals look very different, and 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 that anatomically they are they are quite different. Fur seals in appearance are uh, a lot closer to sea lions. It's probably wrong that we call them seals all the time, but we should be calling them as a group fur seals. But no, technically they are not sea lions. They are fur seals. Um, guys, I just uh, want to take the chance to thank you all so much for, for chipping in. I'm so sorry I could not attend to all the questions. Uh, if I had to get to all the questions, it would take me days and days to, to get through all them. At any point, you're always welcome to send us a direct message if you have any specific questions, and I promise we will be doing the live chats more often. Um, support on YouTube has been absolutely amazing. Um, we've Considering that we've only really started pushing this a few months ago, we've completely overwhelmed. Thank you so much to everybody out there. It's been really, really cool. And um, till we, uh, till we meet again, thank you so much.